imaging, improved access to MR imaging can transform patient care. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by tapping them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access that recording. And if at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We're here to help. With that, I'm pleased to welcome today's speakers. First, we have Dr. Chris Fox, who is an emergency physician and chair of the UCI School of Medicine's Department of Emergency Medicine at UCI Health. Dr. Fox went to Tufts Medical School and did his residency in emergency medicine at UC Irvine. In 2001, he joined the faculty at UC Irvine, where he trained 30 fellows in emergency ultrasound. His primary focus is ultrasound integration into medical education and directs the four-year ultrasound curriculum at UC Irvine School of Medicine. He is a professor of clinical emergency medicine and chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine. Next, we have Dr. Daniel Chow, who is a neuroradiologist and co-director for the Center for Artificial Intelligence in Diagnostic Medicine at the Radiological Sciences School of Medicine at UCI Health. Dr. Chow joined the University of California, Irvine in 2016 and holds an appointment as Assistant Professor in Residence for the Department of Radiological Sciences and Neurology. He completed his medical degree at the University of California, Los Angeles in 2010. Dr. Fox and Dr. Chow, thank you for being here today. Dr. Chow, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So today, um, Dr. Fox and I will be sharing our experience with a portable MRI uh, here at UCI. Uh, we acquired this device sometime in January, and we're going to be sharing some of our initial experiences. So briefly, um, our disclosures. And so we've laid out this talk into four parts. The first goes into the background about this, a little bit about the device, our motivation about acquiring the device. Then we'll review some images. Uh, we'll review some of the performance data that we've seen as an impact of this uh, point of care MRI. And then with the remainder of the time, uh, we'll be have a discussion. So what is a portable MRI? So this kind of this has kind of made waves in the health imaging sphere. It was voted as one of the top imaging stories of 2020, and this was recently just FDA cleared um, last November. And for us, you know, we thought this as a potentially low-cost solution to help image patients that would not normally be able to be imaged. Um, on the left, you can see what the MRI looks like. It's mobile. Uh, it can be controlled with a joystick. And in the yellow, I don't know if you can see this, but this yellow ring on top represents the, the Gauss line. So what is the added value of MR imaging for ER and ICU patients? So first and foremost, you know, MRI, portable MRI are not a replacement for CT. CT is still our first line go-to test. However, oftentimes though, the follow-up exam for these patients will be an MRI uh, due to its superior contrast resolution which is really important for things like ischemia, encephalitis, and some mass lesions. Um, if you look at the literature, there's been several reported papers in critical care literature and ER literature that uh, MR findings does reveal imaging features that would have been missed on routine CT. Common things missed are subtle hemorrhages, ischemia, infection, metabolic diseases. Uh, this is just another shot of our portable MRI uh, just next to a gurney. And so, you know, we know that MRI is very important um, in, in the diagnostic assessment for ER and ICU patients, but what are some of the challenges for MRI? So, first and foremost, we know and we have seen a steady increase in demand for MRI capabilities. Um, however, expanding resources for MRI does cause a significant number of resources. 
um, let alone the magnet, uh, being able to cite the building um, different electrical requirements and infrastructure requirements. Other things that we've seen operationally is that delays in MRI have been associated with increased hospital costs. Uh, that was from one of the articles. And also in the Canadian, Canadian literature, uh, they found that inadequate access to MRI was one of the predictors for failing to meet their established length of stay requirements, more than CT and more than ultrasound. So we definitely recognize that there are both you know, operational challenges for uh, MR availability. This is a proto chart of our cases at UCI Health for specifically our inpatients and ER patients. And one of the things that we wanted to see was what is the highest demand order item in an ER and IC setting, uh, inpatient setting. And what we found was the biggest demand came from brain MRIs. Uh, the first one was brain MRI with or without contrast, followed by brain MRI without contrast. And in terms of imaging time, um, it is the second brain MRIs constitute our first and second most uh, duration exams. So for us, the portable point of camera, it kind of made sense because for at least in our practice, um, this was one of the most common order studies for us, at least the second most common. So we talked about some of the challenges in an ER setting and what are some of the challenges in an ICU setting. So I got this picture as a joke from one of my um, IC nurses, and they lovingly call going down to the MRI as kind of the black hole. And that's because transport from radiology to the uh, to and from radiology from the ICU is a very frequent des frequent destination. However, it's a tremendous amount of valuable personal resources. Typically, what's involved is you have about one to two transport technologists, an ICU nurse, and a respiratory therapist. And one of the things that we experienced during COVID is that some of these personal resources are the most valuable. You know, respiratory therapists and ICU nurses became exceedingly valuable resources. Um, also, our ICU nurses generally don't prefer not to have to spend an hour and a half to go down to MRI when they have patients in the unit. Same thing for our respiratory therapists. On the flip side, on the scanners, you know, we can't have ICU patients laying on the hallway. So what we generally do is we'll block off time slots beforehand while we wait for the ICU patient to come. And it becomes a large orchestra to coordinate scanning and ICU patients. The other thing to factor in is from an outcome perspective, you know, we have to find for patients on life, life supportive devices, uh, we have to find MR compatible devices for that. A lot of times we have alarms that may or not be heard. Um, and so it's kind of a big deal to just go from the ICU to MRI. And this is kind of an example of a you know, high level workflow, uh, workflow. So on the top level, when an MRI is ordered in an ICU or ER setting, you know, the patient is prepared, transport goes to pick up the patient, transports the patient to MRI, and then transports the patient back, and then there's the post-MRI examination. And our thought process is, could we change more to the lower half where we, instead of having the patients coming down to MRI, can we send the MRI towards the patients? So that's that first half, kind of like the background information for some of the motivations. Next, I'm going to share some of the pictures. So this was my portable MRI. This is the portable MRI that I had uh, myself, and we can see that we have our conventional uh, sequences. We have a T1, T2 flare uh, and a diffusion up here. This was one of, our, one of our earlier patients that we imaged. This was a patient who had vague neurologic symptoms. Um, and you know the bedside MRI looked fairly normal to us. Uh, this was our first MRI, so we wanted to get a follow-up to confirm, and you can kind of see the differences. And so, you know, first and foremost, the quarter four MRI is not a replacement for a fixed MRI. Um, and I'm not gonna say, and the pictures definitely have a lower resolution. However, you know, we were still able to answer the diagnostic question, which was this was normal. And so one of the things that we've been learning is for a portable MRI, you know, the goal isn't necessarily to make pretty pictures, but the goal is to get diagnostic images to answer the clinical question. So I'm going to show some other examples. This was a case of a traumatic brain injury. So this is a case where 
they had gone first in MRI. We can see a lot of the hemorrhagic contusion. And now in our ICU, um, they were unstable for, for follow-up imaging, and so we were able to image them in the ICU. This is a patient. This is during COVID. Um, patient had a right-sided stroke. He went on to thrombectomy and then went upstairs to the ICU. He was on, I think, seven devices, including being intubated, and he was too unstable that neither CT nor MRI could accommodate him because he was so medically unstable. And so this was a patient that we were able to bring the portable MRI and look at the extent of injury, which led to uh, prognostic data that aided the team's decision. Uh, classic left MCA infarct, you know, uh, showing we can see. Um, this was a nice multifocal infarct and subdural hematoma. Um, so we got the first MRI in the ICU when the patient was unstable, and we could see that there are these areas of infarction. And also what we also observed was there is this trace subdural hematoma. And then on the follow-up when the patient became stable, we wanted to get check for progression and we could uh, reestablish some of these findings. And so one of the things that you know we were pleased with was the ability to even see smaller uh, subdural collection. This is another nice case that was useful in decision making. So the patient had first got a uh, brain MRI which showed a left occipital infarct. In the ICU, the patient had progressed, was unstable for follow-up imaging. So we got a portable MRI and we could see that the extent of the infarct had grown and was also beginning to involve the contralateral hemisphere, which was confirmed on the follow-up CT when the patient became more stable. Um, this was actually a, a nice ER case. This was an 84-year-old that had um, altered metal status. So we had seen kind of this, this left PCA infarct, but one of the things that we didn't see on the CT was the right cellular velar infarct. And this is an area where we know that CT tends to struggle with, which is that posterior fossa or that cerebellum uh, infarcts. And so this is a nice case for us. Uh, this is just another suspected stroke case. Uh, we were able to get the portable MRI uh, pretty quickly to show that abnormality. And I'm going to show a couple cases where uh, we have some misfindings. So of the uh, cases that we've had, uh, about Six of the cases were either non-diagnostic or not fully confident about, and of those six cases, three had a new finding that was missed on the portable, and I'm gonna show some of those cases. So this is the first case. So this was a right uh, brainstem infarct, you can see on the right. On the left is the portable, and the challenge that we've had for some patients is that for really obese patients, it's not really a weight limit so much as a body habit is limit. And so this patient couldn't fit all the way to the top of the coil. And so the inferior half of that brain was cut off. And so we never had a chance to see this. And so that's one of the limitations we've seen is for patients who are too large. This is another one. This is a missed stroke. And so we've had a, this is a patient you can see there's um, artifact from overlying uh, material on the patient's head when it's being monitored, but also uh, the resolution that we've been seeing is about five millimeters. And so these are, next I'm going to switch to some of the operational improvements. And so this is, you know, some of the initial prelim data that we've seen. Uh, when we looked at the fixed magnets, we can see that there's a prolonged time duration ER in the ICU. And, you know, the reason why for the 1.5 and 3T, the ICU is so long, it, it, it tends to be instability. So a lot of times the MRI will be ordered uh, in the ICU, but then the patient is still too unstable to come down, and so then they'll wait the next day or wait until they become stable. And because we're a tertiary center, we do have some patients who are just sometimes too medically unstable to come down. Uh, you can also see um, for the portable MRI, we've been able to drive those times down significantly and to at least get a diagnostic picture of what's going on. What's been interesting for us is the ability for a portable MRI that it seems that there's a trend to improve existing resources. Um, one of the things that we've seen is that on days that we use the hyperfine magnet, we're actually scanning more patients on the fixed scanner as well. So we can, see, and these are numbers of MRIs, all MRIs, 
as it relates to our 1.5 and 3T system in the inpatient setting, uh, in, in the inpatient hospital, sorry. We can see that for all MRIs on days when the hyperfine is not being used, we're scanning on average about 32 patients, and when the hyperfine is being used, about 38 patients. The hypothesis and thought process that we, we've given around for this is that, you know, now we are removing those really complicated patients who may expend more resources from a fixed MRI, and that improves the efficiency and throughput of our fixed scanners. And so this was kind of an interesting finding. Um, if I were to add in the actual hyperfine scans being done on those days, uh, then the p-value becomes significant. But this is just purely what's on our 1.5 and 3T systems. And so next, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Fox, who's going to speak more from a clinician's perspective from the emergency department setting. Chris? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chow, for that uh, for that preamble. That was great. Um, I am so he he spoke from the uh, radiology perspective, and you could see on some of those images the uh, the difference between the portable MRI and the uh, fixed MRI. I'm going to talk about um, a lot more from the emergency department uh, perspective and sort of our experience with it uh, so far, and sort of the reason we're very interested in this. And so. Um, we do a, about 5% of our patients in the ED have an MRI, so it's a pretty small percentage of our ED patients. And of that 5%, 3% of those are brain MRIs. The rest are spine and extremity. So, you know, from, in terms of this device that only does brain MRI currently, this would be maybe about 3% of our patients could potentially qualify for it. So it's not a huge demand, but the problem is the turnaround time for MRI and the, when the, and the data when you look at it over years worth of time, and this is geometric uh, time, so it uh, doesn't include the really long tails, is about eight hours. When you, when you start to look at some of these really long tails, though, you could have a turnaround time for an ED MRI as long as 12 hours. And so, you know, we, we know that when, you know, Dr. Chow called it the, uh, the, the, the black hole of MRI, <laughs> We, we, we have, you know, similar uh, sentiment down in the ED that, um, you know, we're trying to get our patients out the door in five hours of the patients we discharge. And so we know that the clock is always ticking on those patients to improve our own ED length of stay and our, and our throughput. And so to put somebody in the uh, MRI is really, you know, problematic. It's so problematic, in fact, that we, had, we, we ended up creating our own observation protocol for patients needing MRI, meaning that it was taking so long to get these MRIs and it was prolonging the ED length of stay that we created an observation protocol so that they would go uh, you know, stop the clock and go into the ED observation unit. We have a 12-bed ED observation unit with about 30 protocols, and one of them is the advanced imaging protocol, a.k.a. MRI protocol, because that's what we use it for. And so on, you can see the problem here is that we, we need the MRI, and uh, in, the, in the course of my 20-year career, you know, I think emergency physicians would all say this. We've seen a real uptick in the amount of MRIs being uh, performed, and um, and so having this protocol in place was, was uh, helpful. And um, so I'm just going to click to the next slide here. The uh, oh, uh, oh yeah, here we are. And so um, and then the other thing is, you know, point of care testing is really become a, a large part of our ED culture. We're, we're used to that, right? So we get lots of point-of-care laboratory tests that help us right out in the front in triage uh, and to help kind of um, get some information back right away on a patient so that um, we improve our, our throughput that way and decrease our length of stay. And it makes us better diagnosticians from the beginning that we don't shotgun so much and use unnecessary workups. And that's really where point-of-care ultrasound, my passion throughout my career, has played a huge role. About a third of our ED patients get a point of care ultrasound, and that helps us, uh, again, uh, helps us become more accurate in the uh, care of the patient and reduces the uh, sort of shotgun effect of ordering too much labs and imaging that can ultimately slow down the, uh, the process. And so, um, and so when it comes to, you know, adopting uh, another point of care or, 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 or a test that can be brought to the patient rather than the patient going to the test, this is, of course, um, got, gets a lot of excitement in my own specialty. Um, and so, um, so that, for that reason, I think we're really excited. In fact, if you look at that picture here um, on the screen, you can see actually um, the, the, the setting here, how we do a point-of-care MRI. 
we have um, this is rooms uh, three and four in my ED. Um, if we remove the patient out of room four, and say we're going to scan the patient room three, we turn the the, the gurney um, sideways or, or transverse access there between and, and use in two rooms. Uh, and have the MRI kind of come in uh, over the patient's head there. And so you can actually, as long as you move the patient, the other patient that was in room four out of there, you can do an MRI uh, in the ED right there at the point of care. When I first heard about portable MRI, it, the, the, the two words didn't even like, I thought, how can they do that? What, a portable MRI, how is it even possible? What about the magnet and everything? And you see that little green ring around there? That's the, the distance uh, that you got to that uh, they could they could start uh, tugging on metal objects, and so as long as you get your your phone and your keys and everything away from that green ring, then this is a, a safe device that can be deployed uh, right there at the point of care. Now, one of the things um, that we find that drives a lot of our brain MRIs though is uh, is neurology consultation in the ED. So meaning that when it comes to a patient having neurologic findings, subtle um, neurologic uh, findings on their physical examination or potentially having a stroke, um, we consult neurology. Neurology comes down, they're the experts in that neurologic exam. And, you know, us being a, you know, a, a big academic medical center, you know, we have those access to those neurologists all the time. And, the, you know, they're the real expert there. And they tell us, you know, after our physical exam, we don't think this patient has a, a lesion that would make any sense on an MRI, so don't get the MRI. Or they'll say, yeah, this patient definitely needs an MRI. I would say the majority of the time that we consult neurology, uh, upwards of 90% of the time we consult them, they're going to order an MRI. And so, um, and so they really drive that culture uh, of at least for brain MRI in the ED quite a bit, at least in my institution. Now, a, a main reason we a main reason that we do call uh, neurology is to rule out help us rule out those small strokes. And so um, the problem with uh, that we're seeing in a few little cases, and uh, Dr. Chow showed you one case of it was that. Uh, in, in, in trying to rule out a small stroke, it had missed that uh, that small stroke. The uh, the portal MRI did, and was picked up on the fixed MRI. And so we kind of uh, our current indications then to do a, uh, a portable uh, MRI is to rule in a large stroke in lieu of doing a CT scan, meaning that a patient has a, a dense hemiplegia. It's kind of like a a, you know, it looks like a pretty textbook stroke uh, with a large lesion, and then we confirm it right there with the uh, with the point of care MRI, without needing to um, to do a CT scan that moment. The other reason that we would uh, uh, do an MRI is the patient was just, from a vital sign standpoint, you know, too unstable, too risky to to take an unstable patient to the MRI machine, and those patients are getting the portable MRI right there in my resuscitation base. Um, so, so my perspective when I when I you know stop and kind of we're very very early on with this. I mean, we, you know, we only have a few. We've done it a few times here, and uh, and and so we don't have a huge data set. We do have an IRB uh, approved um, study that's going on to look at this. But you know, as we get more and more prospective studies comparing the fixed MRI to the portable MRI, you know, some of the indications that I'd love to be able to see through some good prospective studies would be looking at the posterior fossa. That's that the back of the head there with the cerebellum and all that. You know, CT scan classically misses things in the posterior fossa, strokes and tumors back there. So if this portable MRI uh, was going to be able to pick those up quickly at the uh, at the point of care, that would be something really exciting. Um, Wake-up strokes, where we just don't know when the last known well window is, uh, and quickly looking for an infarct there and some salvageable tissue using MR, uh, you know, would be amazing. I showed you my length of stay for MR over years worth of time was the geometric length, of <laughs> the geometric turnaround time was eight hours. I mean, when you're looking at a, a wake-up stroke when you don't know when their last known well window is and you're trying to find that salvageable tissue, certainly having a port of it a portable point of care MRI would be a huge value there. But, you know, again, a prospective study finding um, those patients would be um, the next step. We have a lot of patients with uh, hydrocephalus and uh, with shunts. And I think, um, you know, at least, you know, once a day we're looking at the ventricles to try to find out if there's a sh problem with their shunt. And these patients get, you know, lots and lots of head CTs over their lifetime, and it would be nice to be able to uh, use MR instead of that uh, CT scanner in these patients. 
immediate post-thrombectomy MRI is another one to, um, to, to follow up the thrombectomy. And also, you know, sometimes patients just, you don't know if they have metal or not in their body when you need to get an MRI on them. And so this has a very low field uh, magnet. And so I think um, in, a, in a situation where you're unable to get the information about screening for metal devices, um, the, the low field magnet is such low risk that that's, a, that's another um, you know, perspect, uh, possibility there in those patients. So again, you know, we're very early on here, at least at UCI with using this. There's not a lot of huge prospective, you know, uh, trials out there yet to, to, to really find out, you know, tease out what the other indications are going to be. We're very excited about its potential. Uh, and, uh, and again, we do have the, that IRB at least rolling at our hospital to, uh, to see, what, see what this is going to look like down the line. Dan, I'll I'll take it. I'll uh, I'll send it back to you now to uh, to for the conclusion. Sure, thank you, thank you, Chris. And so I think the big the big takeaways is you know point of care MRI is not a replacement for fixed MRI. However, there are definitely use cases, especially for emergent and critical patients. You know, I think some of the use the best use cases we have found are you know those patients you know who who would otherwise not been able to be imaged due to uh, various reasons. Uh, the portable MRI uh, is definitely much less resource intensive uh, and can be acquired much more rapidly. And then lastly, you know, preliminarily, uh, for our initial uh, patients that we've been scanning, it seems as though it's improving the resources of our current fixed uh, imaging systems for MRIs, which has been uh, very positive for us. And, and I think with that, we will move on to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox and Dr. Chow, for a really great presentation today. Like Dr. Chow said, we'll now start today's question and answer session. So if you haven't already, you can submit any questions you have for Dr. Fox and Dr. Chow by typing them into the Q&A chat box on your webinar council. We've already got a ton of great questions that have come in, so I'll kick off the discussion um, with this question from an audience member. They're wondering, is it possible to even come close to ruling out small AIS with hyperfine? Sure. So when you say AIS, I assume you mean acute infarcts. Um, I would say it depends on what your definition of small is. If you're talking about less than five millimeters, I would say it, we have seen those cases be missed. So I would say sub five millimeters, uh, we generally do not see those infarcts. Greater than five millimeters, you know, whether it's brainstem or uh, super tutorial, we've been able to catch those. Got it. Thank you for breaking that down. Really great question. Next question is, um, you know, how many ED hyperfine MRIs end up getting repeated? What do you see, um, Dr. Chow or Dr. Fox? Sure. I can, I actually have those numbers right now. So we've done about, I think, 10 in the ED, of which about two have been repeated. Of those two that were repeated, uh, one uh, of those two that were repeated, one was because of artifact, and the other one, um, artifact was specifically motion, and the other one was also uh, motion. So the, the, it was one of those. It was Got a situation it. was we didn't want to sedate the patient in the, in the ER for a portable, and so we ended up going to the fixed scanner for those two patients. Thank you so much for sharing those examples. It's really helpful. Um, next question from audience member. What has been your experience with using Hyperfine for intraoperative imaging? We have, I don't know if it's available for that. I think we have, do we have someone from the Hyperfine team that might be able to answer that? Because I don't think it's approved for intraop. We've never tried to do that. I don't know if you're on, Dr. Knopp. Yes, thank you, Dan. So the FDA approval does not include intraoperative imaging at this time. You took the patient out of the OR physically into the hallway, then that would be covered, but it's in hospital outside of the operating room. Thank you so much. Our next question is about insurance. Audience member is curious, do you anticipate any insurance reimbursement issues with portable MRI? So thus far from our initial uh, I guess three months now experience, uh, we've been able to get reimbursed from insurance. So I've seen the reimbursements for it, if that answers the question. 
and it's reimbursed under the same CP, uh, CPT code uh, for brain MRI without contrast. I think that's 70551. Yeah, just from my perspective and with point of care ultrasound to chime in on that, we we have the same codes for point of care ultrasound, whether it's done at the bedside or, you know, or, or radiology ultrasound, the same set of codes. And so we've had no issues getting uh, reimbursed with ultrasound because it was a point of care test. And I wouldn't expect any difference with, uh, you know, point of care MRI. Got it. Thank you both so much. And audience members, keep continuing putting in your questions. Um, we've had so many great um, questions come through so far, so I really appreciate your engagement here. Um, next question is, um, how many patients scanned with the hyperfine ended up being subsequently scanned in the fixed magnet? Yeah, give me one second. So we've had uh, around 25 patients scanned so far. Um, about six have been six have been nine six have been nine diagnostic to needing a repeat, and so six out of the 25. Excellent, thank you. I've got a question about um, international use. An audience member is wondering: Is the hyperfine approved for use by medical regulatory organizations in Brazil, Chile, Peru? Or Portugal, um, you know, any of those countries, is it approved in them? I do not know the answer to that question, and I would defer that to uh, Dr. Knopf from Hyperfine. So, thank you, Dan. Let me take that question. As of presently, the Hyperfine is approved by the FDA for use in the United States. We are working with regulatory authorities, initially in the United Kingdom and the EU, for both CE and EU mark. Following that, we will move to South America. Uh, as you can imagine, these processes take uh, some time, but it's clearly on a roadmap, and we're actively pursuing these additional areas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next question is, um, you know, someone's wondering, for patients who aren't able to complete the fixed MRI due to anxiety or claustrophobia, or they're unable to tolerate due to pain, you know, has this proven to be a viable option in your perspective? Chris, do you want to take this one? I feel like you've seen more. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. So it's funny because um, it depends on the patient's sort of what triggers their claustrophobia because if it's their whole body is inside of a tube, you know, a round structure around their whole body, then this is a this is actually a much more open system. Like it's just your head that you got to put into the coil. But if your deal with claustrophobia is, you know, you don't want anything close to your head in your face, then this is not the right, uh, you know, environment for you. Because you do put your head into this coil that's pretty close to your face. And so it's uh, it just sort of it depends on the patient. Um, but yeah, but I've uh, I've had I've had some pretty good ex you know luck here so far using it with um, a little bit of an anxiolytic and um, and they've been tolerating it pretty well. Thanks so much for your perspective there. Appreciate that. Um, next audience question is around um, image imaging study. You know, how long do you find that each imaging study is? Um, about the same time as re regular routine brain MRI without. So it's not any faster or longer right now. I do believe the vendor is working on some deep learning reconstruction to speed up the imaging time. But as of right now, it's no faster or slower than a routine brain MRI. Thank you. So that's Dr. about Chow. what, 25, 25 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes? About 25 minutes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, about 25 minutes. Perfect. Thanks so much for that clarification. Um, audience member is wondering about, you know, Hyperfine's use in angio suites. Do you have any um, information you can share about that? Um, we have, I mean, the times that we've done it in post um we do the MRI when they're in the ICU um, only because, you know, we don't want to bring that device into an angio suite. Usually the angio suite is being rotated for different patients. And so, what we've done is we've had the portable MRI in the ICU as the post angio patients coming up. Got it. Thank you so much for that explanation there. 
Next question is around costs. Someone's wondering, what is the budgetary expense for the Hyperfine as compared to a fixed MRI scanner? <laughs> Several orders of magnitude different. Um, yeah. Dr. Nob, am I allowed to mention, are you, do you, are you allowed to disclose, am I allowed to disclose the price or do you want to disclose it or? No, feel free. The pricing is on the official Hyperfine website, but it's okay. similar to the pricing of a car, but feel free, Dan. Okay. So I think the, the lease is about, I think it's about 60 to 70,000 a year. Um, a 1.5 will run you between 500 and 700, and that's not including maintenance or, this, or the service contract or let alone the construction of the site. So when I say several orders of magnitude difference, I really, really do mean that. Thank you so much. Um, we have one question about, um, you know, working with the radiologist using Hyperfine. Have you had any issues there? Well, as a radiologist, I would say no. Um, so far, I think that's actually a really, really good and important question. One of the things that we did before we brought in the portable was that this was very much a team decision. Um, I was working with Dr. Fox from the emergency room, uh, also Dr. Yu, one of the neurologists, and myself as the neuroradiologist, and we had all identified potential use cases and needs for this. And, you know, at, for my radiology team, for all of us, we all agreed that, you know, these images are workable. They're not the prettiest images, but more often than not, they're diagnostic and can answer a question. So I would say that, at least from our end, the radiologists have been very, very helpful in, in pushing this through. Um, and I would say that very much that this is a team effort. This wouldn't have happened without ER, neurology, and radiology, and admin working together. I yeah, I would agree. I totally agree that the uh, the amount of alacrity that radiology has showed towards this has been amazing. It's been really a great partnership. Now, neurology, um, you know, uh, can push back when they're ruling out. They know to they know when to push back on this, and they say, "Well, I'm really looking for more subtle, small stroke here." And uh, and so I so on the clinical end of it, uh, I think you'll see a little pushback from. From neurology, and which is uh, to be expected until you know we have some good prospective larger trials out there. Both of those observations are extremely valuable. So thank you both for sharing your perspectives there. Just another reminder to the audience: um, we've had such great dialogue today. Please keep submitting any questions that are coming up um, as they, you know, come up in your head, and we will get to them. Our next question is about something that you had talked about before a large patient you know did not fit into the coil they're wondering on the opposite extreme could a small pediatric patient be scanned beyond their head or is the device only designed for a head scan uh, we have not imaged uh, a child yet because we're not that practice however you know it's something that we would be willing to do uh, it, it is fda approved for pediatric patients as well as far as I, as far as i know Great, thank you so much. I've got a technical question that has come in. Someone's wondering, does anyone know if image quality is good enough to see DWI flare T2 mismatch? So I would say yes. Um, the flare and T2 images are very, very crisp. The diffusion, it's a non-EPI diffusion, so sometimes it's a little bit harder. But I would say yes, you, if the question is for a diffusion flare mismatch, you could see that. Um, at our institution, though, that's not our practice for, I assume that question is trying to rule out kind of penumbra for acute strokes. Um, for us, for patients within that four and a half window, you know, we're still a CT hospital first where we will do the CT to rule out the hemorrhage, the CTA to rule out the occlusion, and then the perfusion. But for hospitals that derive more as diffusion, uh, diffusion flare mismatch, the image quality is good enough for that. Got it. Thank you. And I know we just talked about radiologists and emergency um, medicine physicians. You know, there's support there, maybe not so much with or neurology. Um, it varies, but I'm wondering about administrative support, um, about acquisition of this technology. Um, are there any pitfalls that list listeners should avoid, or do you have any best practices to share about getting administrative buy-in? Um. I'll share my experience, and Chris, I'd love to hear your experience. Um, I think from the radiology side, 
you know, what, what I had generated, I think I showed that Pareto chart earlier, was just showing what the demand would be, what the current turnaround times were, and what the potential uh, pro forma would be from acquiring this device. Um, and I think when you when we did the math, it had made sense from a pilot perspective. And so admin was actually very, very, very helpful in this. Uh, procurement was very, very helpful with getting this through. I don't know what your experiences were, Chris. Yeah, I would agree. I think when you approach admin, you approach it from, you know, a um, you can approach it from two angles. One is a uh, patient, uh, you know, quality safety standpoint that you could get, you could uh, image um, a stroke a lot faster with this um, point of care technology and get an answer really quickly that could result in, um, you know, a better patient outcome. We don't know exactly what that looks like yet, again, without the research, but from a you know, early standpoint, that's that's one angle. And the other angle, of course, as I mentioned, is that you start looking at um, turnaround times for MRI in your own institution, and you get some of that data, and, you know, you can show the opportunity that this would provide in that setting as well. Maybe a good follow-up question to that. We have another question around sort of this buy-in. And Dr. Chow, as a radiologist, you know, how were you involved in the decision to acquire the technology? Um, and again, if there's any pitfalls or best practices to share that you took away from the experience. Um, I would say that at least for this device, this was very clinically, this was very much driven by the clinicians. So it was radiology, myself and my chair, um, Dr. Fox, when I think the three of us collectively were the ones driving this. Is that my understanding? Is that correct, Chris? You know, when I first saw the device, um, uh, well, it was at a conference, and um, I was at an emergency medicine conference, and and the um, and I had a lot of my faculty at that conference hitting me up to get it, <laughs> and saying this would really help us with our MRI woes. And I said, you know, and so I started looking at it from that standpoint, not knowing that simultaneously uh, radiology was looking at it too. And because I, I was wondering, you know, how is this going to sit with radiology, these other types of images? Because I look at the two images and I'm not a radiologist. I'm not sure what they can see, can't see on this portable unit. So it was great that there's just sort of happenstance that uh, radiology had been looking at it too. And so it was just an immediate kind of, you know, marriage between us and radiology. Um, to get this done. And so I think, again, the word alacrity comes to mind. It's just like they were they were excited to work with us on it. And so um, that aligned up pretty well. And then our stroke, from neurology, we had our stroke director who saw this and really got excited about the potential there. And so, um, so yeah, so I think all three services kind of came together pretty quickly. And like within a month, it showed up in our ED. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably the fastest purchase I've ever heard of at UCI Health. <laughs> yeah. That's excellent to hear about that synergy there. Thanks for sharing those stories, Dr. Fox and Dr. Chow. Um, another reminder to the audience, we still have some time left. If you have a question that you would like asked, please submit it in the Q&A box. We have a question that's come through about um, safety screening. Someone's wondering, are there any safety screening for Hyperfine for this technology? Um, that you guys can talk about. Yeah, we we still even though it's an ultra even though it's low field, we still do the routine MR safety screening. Um, that being said, if the device is nowhere near the Gauss line, then we'll generally let that pass. Um, and so we have definitely, but we'll definitely do our our routine our questionnaire. Yeah, you know. Um... So when we talk about the size of this magnet, you know, a regular a fixed MRI is either 1.5 or 3 Tesla. Um, Dan, what is the, the, what's the difference between that and this? How much less of a magnet is this? Uh, order of magnitude, this is what, 0 0.07, 0 0.068? Yeah, com 0 0.068 compared to 1.5. So you can see huge difference there in the magnetic field. Uh, what he's talking about, the, I think you're calling it the Gauss line. I mean, this is like... Um, even though we still ask the patients the same questions about implanted metal devices, we also know that there's that green ring that if the device is below, you know, that ring, then potentially there's, um, you know, a lot less to be worried about. 
thanks for that breakdown. It's really helpful to picture that. We have a question about, you know, are there any other applications that you are considering for bedside MR throughout your facility that maybe you haven't originally considered? I think Chris laid out a lot of good examples of the different, of the different things that, you know, we want to do with it um, in terms of, say, strokes, um, post-thrombectomy, hydrocephalus. So I think, you know, those are the big things. Yeah, with the current um, head coil, I think that's, yeah, we 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 kind of thought about some of those other options, but um, I, I, we, my group, my, my emergency physicians also, we also staff another ED on Catalina Island. It's like uh, 26 miles off the coast of Southern California. And so we're, we're out there working in a very small critical access hospital. Uh, they do have a CT scanner out there and, of course, an ultrasound, but they don't have, you know, an MRI. It's a pretty small place. This is another, I think, in these critical access hospitals, uh, you know, this is a great option for a small hospital like that. Uh, again, the um, the resources needed to, to get it there are magnitude smaller, so um, it, I think it would fit in a location like that. Got it, Dr. Fox, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. We're running up um, to the close of our conversation today, um, but we have a final question to go over and around staffing, and someone's wondering which staff are trained on conducting an exam. And, you know, I know we've talked about that there has been harmony at um, UCI Health, um, but any other observations about staff that were selected to be trained on these machines? So I'll say that the device is actually surprisingly very, very simple and easy to use. Um, any of our technologists probably could do it, but from the way um, our technologists are broken down, we still have our MR techs doing it. But there's no reason, you know, like I would say that it's surprisingly pretty easy to use. Um, Chris, you've seen it more, um, what, you know, your, what are your opinions? Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's literally like um, just kind of, patient, getting the patient into the, you know, changing the orientation of the bed, at least from the ED's perspective, uh, in a tight space, changing the orientation of the bed and um, plugging the machine in and having the patient kind of be, you know, scoot forward to put their head into it. And then there's a um, a technician running the whole thing from their iPad um, and getting the images, again, about a half an hour, and and then they're out of there. And so... Um, I was wondering, you know, is this something that, um, like, who in my, who else in my ED could do that if we had, um, you know, uh, somebody trained in it? Because I'm seeing a question right now, how would this device compare a training for point-of-care ultrasound? And um, I was thinking that we're so culturally aligned with point-of-care ultrasound that this might be something my docs could do at some point, um, you know, just kind of like move the patient into the space and then turn it on and, you know, kind of keep an eye on the uh, iPad once in a while. I don't know, because they couldn't stare at an iPad for half an hour, that's for sure. But maybe it's just kind of like, you know, set it and forget it and come back when the alarm goes off. I'm not sure if it's going to be ever to that to that point. But maybe if you're that doc working out in that critical access hospital, this is definitely something that is, uh, you know, in your, in your, you know, that would be part of your wheelhouse, I bet. Well, excellent. I want to thank you both so much for a really informative discussion and also our audience for your engagement today. It's made for a really great um, past 20 minutes of conversation. So thank you. Final thank you to Hyperfine for also sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the content presented today, please do check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thank you.